so when you came in the room, you were analyzing the lights, right? You were looking at the, you looked at the lights like that. You put your hand. So what, what is like, when you go into a place, you sometimes sort of analyze the place, right? You look at the details of the place. Does that take things away from the beauty of things? It could. If you get like too carried away and just start analyzing everything, it, it does. You're no longer in that moment. You're just like nitpicking everything and just, just no longer there. Because then you're here. Because I know, I, I, I remember I had this, I, I came up with this concept and it was beauty versus thought. Beauty versus thought. And the verses is maybe where I'm at right now, but in the future, maybe the verses will become beauty and thought or beauty with thought, right? Because for me, it's like when you're eating a delicious meal, right? And you're like, wow, mm, this is the best thing ever. You're drinking like a nice cup of coffee, like, wow. And then you go in your head and you're like, oh, what's in this? What are the ingredients? And dude, like I always refrain from asking this question. What are the ingredients? It's just so good already. Why go into the... Into Do you really need to go there? Why would you? Why? We just tend to do it all the time because it's like, um, it's, it's especially, I, I don't know. And this is one of the questions I want to ask you, like the difference that you see because you've interacted with so many different cultures, right? Especially in your profession and also where you live, you know, in Tulum, like you interact with so many cultures. And is there something unique about your culture where some, because sometimes we realize our uniqueness against others. Like, oh, they don't have it, I have it. Or they have it, I don't have it. And I see this all the time with Pakistani culture, right? Like my culture and or Indian culture, or whatever. So do you see that? Like like one huge thing for, for what I've seen is a lot of like American culture and, and West is here. It's in the head, right? It's here. It's like, I'm an individual. It's me, me, me. Whereas some other cultures in the East, for example, are sort of like here and they're more like community and love and, and like body. Have you found any, any big differences from your experience, any culture stuff? Man, I, I think there's definitely a, a culture thing to it, but I don't necessarily think that that's all. I, I think that we're like individuals and like exactly the way you portrayed it, I think we interact with so many things right now. It's just like so open that even though we grew up in a certain way with us with a certain uh, set of values, I think that everything is just so global right now that at the end you get to peak. At the end, there's there's always a there's always things to choose from when you're building your personality. And I know that some things are like somehow dictated by like genetics and some others like just like like really core values of your family that you just don't even notice. But I think some of them you like you actually pick out from everything that's available. And I think that we're building ourselves the way we want to, even if it's just um uh, on a not like actual thinking about it way. So were you, did you ever growing up and interacting with different cultures or coming to Tulum or in Chihuahua or anywhere you've been, right? Were you ever shocked by anything? Because when I came to America from Pakistan, dude, I was shocked. I cried for a straight month. Every single day, I, my, great, my great grandmother had just died like right before we left. So I had that trauma. They came here. I couldn't like, I, I mean, I kind of spoke English because I went to English school in Pakistan. So I was like lucky. My brother spoke no English at all. Like he knew nothing. We told him just like anyone says anything, just say what? Just answer with what? <laughs> and just have them repeat it over and over. So he, that's all he knew. He knew one word. So I was shocked, man. I was seeing like, oh, different cultures. And like my parents were immigrants. They had to work all the time. So have you seen anything that shocked you or or made you really question your own culture? Maybe not shocking, but there's definitely this aspect of like 
Latino culture that cultivates me and, and I love. It's like the worm. It's just mad. I think that there's something to like countries that 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 been that have been struggling for a long time. And I think that like Pakistani uh, people can relate to this. Like you get so close to your people because that's all you get. That's that's all you are and that's all you get. So I think that the warm people show towards others it's not all the time. Like you have to know your circle and all of that. Like yeah. It's just yeah. You're not just walking with your heart uh, your heart in your hands. But I think that the the warm that you can get from just getting to know people and just crossing a few words with them for me and, and I think that I'm that way. Like I, I think that I I open myself almost completely in like no time. And that has worked and that has made it difficult at some point, but I, I like it that way. I just, I like to be open about myself. Uh, I think it's just, it's better to trust people until they prove you wrong in, and not the other way around. Okay. So you're sort of like innocent until proven guilty type of... Exactly. Yeah, totally. Uh, mm. It's it's the concept of being vulnerable and so, sort, of, sort of showing your cards, but then you're saying being aware and, and, and like cognizant that you just don't know this person really. Right. Because in, in Urdu, we have a word called bhola bhala. Bhola bhala. And bhola bhala is, uh, they used to call me this all the time, right? Like my, my family, my parents, like everyone. Oh, he's such a bhola bhala. And the board bola bala is basically innocent, right? This 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 thing innocent, where uh, or like w one of Dostoevsky's books. There you see the idiot. Uh, in that book, it's the the character is basically someone who's just very plain and innocent, right? Like, like trust everyone, hugging everyone, like loving everyone. And I had to figure out this concept of being street smart. I've always been very book smart, always A's, you know, aced everything. It was like top of the class, whatever. But then the street smart thing was not in me at all. Like, and I almost was against it. I didn't want to be street smart. I'm like, I don't want to be like them. I don't, oh, that's evil. Oh, that's like, that, that's like a demonic thing. I don't want to be street smart. And then at a certain point in my life, after I got screwed over many times by people, stabbed in the back by best friends, by family members multiple times, I concept like consciously said, you know, Farhan, now you're going to become street smart. Forget about the book stuff. Go do street stuff. And even if you get in trouble, even if you hurt people, right? I was like, hey, if you hurt people's feelings, you offend people, it, it's all good because you're doing it for, you know, a bigger purpose. Or so sort of like, you know, Stalin uh, <laughs> taking everyone to prison or like, you know, what Hitler is doing with, with, uh, with the Jews. And they're like, oh, it's for a bigger purpose, like making, the, making humanity better. So I had that, I, you know, I have that in me too. So I had this sort of the other extreme, not balance, the other extreme, so we go towards a balance. So have you... Have you experienced anything like that in your life? Or were you always street smart? I wouldn't say that I was always, because I, I think it's like maybe not the same example because our lives are so different apart, which is one of the things that I love about meeting you. But I'll say that, yeah, I was a guy with like straight A's, all like just on primary school. And yeah, but something started to change in, in when I was in junior high. What, what what you will call junior high, which is uh, secondary out here. So, at some point, I, I started to become more independent. So I started rolling my friends instead of my family that much. I was always not bullied because I was bigger than the average kid at that age. But I'll say that I was just a screw over all the time. Getting in trouble. Yeah, yeah. Just uh and, and just not not being like like actually like street aware. Like like I wasn't aware of how things worked in the street. So I'll say that yeah, I got 
I got played with a lot, a lot of times until I started to figure out that, okay, that's how it rolls. That's, that's what you have to take care of. Uh, that's what you have to actually pay attention to. And, but no, I wouldn't say that I was uh, always like, like street smart. Not, not at all. Not at all. How do you balance that? How do you balance street smart with book smart? and still be vulnerable and honest with people and, and, and show love. Because you know what, when some people, when you show them love right away, oh, this guy's, this guy's an idiot. Hey, what, what the hell is this guy? There's even, um, I don't know if you know this game, it's called Prisoner's Dilemma. Uh, uh, and then there's like all these different games that, that they, they do in the lab. And it's like, uh, imagine you and me, uh, this is not Prisoner's Dilemma, this is another game. But imagine you and me, um, let's say I'm given a dollar. Right? Someone gives me a dollar and say, you know what? Give Manuel whatever you want out of this dollar. Then we're going to go to Manuel. If he says yes, you both get what you said. If he says no, you get nothing. Right? So if they come to me and I say, oh, out of the dollar, uh, I'm going to take 99 cents and I'm going to give him a penny. Now they come up to you and, and, and they say, do you accept? Tell me, do you accept? Well, like without telling you what the other person said or? No, they, 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 they basically say that I'm keeping 99 cents and you're going to get a penny. Well, that's a penny I didn't have before. Right. Exactly. That's the rational way of doing it. Right. 70% of people, it's, it's probably more than 70. It's probably like, I don't know exact percentage. It's been a long time since I read this paper, but it was a very high percentage of pay people say, no, I'm, I'm not going to, I don't, I, I don't accept. It's completely illogical because you're getting a penny for no reason. But some people have this obsession with status. How am I going to look? There's nobody around. It's just us three, right? Yeah. But it's like, how am I going to look to him? And how am I going to look to myself in the future? Right? And what they've, what they've seen is if, if they inject testosterone in someone, then they become more status. So the percentage of saying, fuck, fuck off, I, 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 I'm not going to give you any money increases. Because when you inject someone with testosterone, the them needing status or like, you know, them trying to buy like a, a designer clothes and there's all these studies been done increases. Right. So it's, there is a, a very scientific mechanism to all this stuff. But what you're saying is like, it's, the, it's basically how can you be not selfish all the time? Because when you don't show your cards to someone, when you don't show your feelings to someone, you're being selfish. You're keeping love from them. You're keeping honesty from them. But then people will just, oh, this guy's an idiot. Why is he smiling all the time? Right? And maybe you come off as fake. You know what I mean? I do, but I think that, like, I wouldn't go as far as just try to in interpret what other people might think of it. I think it's just, like, getting into too much trouble trying to think what other people are thinking because we, we never know. Like, we, we don't even know what we're thinking sometimes, so. I, I feel you and, and I feel what, like where that's coming from. Um, I, I totally believe that it makes sense when, when you like boost someone's uh, testosterone levels, they go like a bit more primal, let's say. And what's the uh, status quo to a, a, group of, a group of primates? It's survival. Makes sense. Makes total sense. So I think that it, it's, it's a choice. And I, choice, uh, I choose to present myself as... And even though, like, even though I'm choosing, like I'm not giving everything away. I'm just giving what I think. Maybe not logically. And I know, I'm not thinking about it while I, while I do it but I'm pretty sure that happens. I'm choosing what to, cho what to show the, the world. It's, it's not, this is all of me. 
it's not because like I don't think we usually present ourselves as, as everything we are. Like we we have like this facade for social purposes. And it, it, that's the way it works. It's just I am not saying it's it's bad or wrong or anything. So I wouldn't say that it, it's selfish, but because the like the other way around. It'll be exhausting to just be every time like trying at your fullest and just uh, trying to connect with everyone. So you sort of like find a middle ground. You find middle ground where you can just present yourself in a way and just give the person a choice if they're going to engage with you. And ah, feel it out. Yeah, exactly. And how, how deep are they going to go? Uh, so maybe you give a little bit. Let's see if they they give a little. Exactly, because like you dance. It's always like that. It's it's social interaction. It's always like that. You don't want to overwhelm uh, overwhelm people. Got it. Because especially introvert introverted people, man. Because uh, they very easily, man. Like I was listening to Tim Ferriss the other day, and he said when he's at a party, or like a dinner even, every like an hour, he'll have to go to the bathroom for ten minutes and and chill. That's crazy, man. That's crazy. Now, speaking of choice, you talked about choice. You know how how much you're going to show to someone. Recently, you had to make a choice because you got uh, an an amazing offer, and and I'm not going to reveal where. I want to let let you reveal everything, and and show tell us like, was that how hard of a choice that was, or was it maybe it was a really easy choice, and how do you deal with decision making? Like when you have to make a big decision, are there categories that you care about or you really consider before making a choice? I usually would. Uh, I'll usually maybe not make like a physical list, but just in my head lay out the pros and cons. In this specific case, there wasn't much to think about. It was, you know, it, it's, it feels cliche uh, like and i realized that and i and i just like um talked about this enough times to so it feels like a, like a made up story at this point but it's just the way it is i was just <laughs> a couple of weeks ago i was just laying in my hammock my place just thinking you know got off work got there it was a bit hot just turned up the uh turned on the fan I was just laying there thinking, you know what, this is nice. I've reached a point where it's like, I enjoy my routine, I enjoy my job, it's relatively easy, it's like I know the deal already, uh, I know that people that visit my job like me. This is nice, you know, like I got to a point where I'm relaxing and and just like going with the flow, but it's not struggling anymore. It's 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 comfortable. It's 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 nice. And then a couple of days passed by, and and I got this offer, and it's it's a game changer, at least for me, because um, it's an opportunity that, if played right, could change my cards in the game. And I'm talking about like coming from, uh, well, not like poor, poor household, but just below middle class Mexican family. Uh, both parents are teachers. So it wasn't an accommodated life. It was, it wasn't like, like barefoot, um, poor, but there wasn't any uh, like luxuries or anything. It was just. Everything was covered, like like main necessities, but there wasn't any luxuries. So it was just getting by month by month, and uh, like it's fine. I I I I really enjoy that because that that gave me some like street credentials, and and I love it. I got to hang out with my friends and and spend a lot of time with my my family of of cho like of choosing, like you know this uh, 
because I believe that friends are a family that you choose. And so that made me super independent from a, from a young age. So this opportunity for me, it's, it's an opportunity to save up some money and maybe just use it to like, like just a step to go somewhere else and keep on working and keep on saving. So at some point I can just like maybe come back and start a business or get a property because right now with like the salaries that you get over here and the price of property is just up the chart like it, it just doesn't add up as i'm sure that it's it's the case in a lot of places in the world right now so it is it, it is a game changer if um if, tell us about tell us about it though like what happened like you were there where what's the what's the job where are you gonna go you know how was the decision making process talk about that Give us some some juicy stuff. Well, I'm a barista. I do coffee for a living and um, photography and video as well. You know it. And I've always just uh, been just jumping from one to another in certain times of my life. Yeah, some people might say uh, jack of all trades, master of none, but that's not the complete phrase. It, the complete phrase. I, my bad. I'm just. I just don't remember. Like I, I can't um, quote it, I can't quote it, but the the phrase ends as still better than doing nothing. It is still better than just not mastering anything and just like trying to focus on just one thing and not accomplishing it. So for me, it was uh, not really a hard decision and it was a no brainer. Whenever uh, this guy, um, that invited me over. Well, not invite me over, but he worked there already. He's been there for a season. And whenever I met this guy and we were talking, he was like, yeah, I used to work in, um, in this um, paradisiac Caribbean island. And it was really nice, you know, like there was a lot of work. And yeah, maybe it's a small island, so there's not much to do, but you get to save up and, and it's an opportunity. Whenever he said that, and I just picture myself. But you knew where it was exactly, or he just kind of like made it. No, he, no, I'm just making it like for like, you know, spicing up purposes. Oh, that I get. Uh, but no, he 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 was open about it, and and I was like, man, that sounds great. And I started like to get even like this itch, this like nervousness, because because I knew that it was going to happen at some point, because he told me that he was going back. And I was like, man, you should bring me with you. It's like, man, you have good English. Like you're committed to your job. I don't see why not. Like whatever I go, like I'll just talk good about you. And yeah, man, we will make it happen. So we started working together. So when, when I met him, this was like maybe like five months ago. He was a bartender at, at a bar that I usually go to. And yeah, we would just hit it up, talk, and, and just have a good time. Then he started working with me. I started teaching him about coffee. So he, he was like really attentive. Uh, you, you can always tell when someone is like really interested in something because they'll just give you their full attention and to just they'll try not to skip a word you say. So he was really attentive, so I could tell that he was listening and, and that he was receptive. We started working together, and all of a sudden, one night, we were just uh, having a beer, and he's like, you know what? I got the permit. I got the permit approved. I'm going. Visa, like a visa. Yeah, like like the, the work permit. And I asked him, like, how long would that take? Like, two weeks stops. So it got me nervous because I knew that I was going somehow. Like er anything was uh, was figured out at that point or talked about. But I know that I was going. So I knew that I was going. So whenever he went, we had like a little like just goodbye party, farewell party. And maybe two weeks after that, like he got there. Not even a week passed. And he's like, you won't believe this. They have a new opening 
because it, it's a hospitality group. Um, they're like apparently the second uh, biggest group in in Bahamas. This is it, Bahamas. So they have an opening. It's a, a coffee shop within a, a hotel, and they don't have a barista. So I talked to the guy about you, and he's gonna call you like in minutes. I was at my place. I was just just chilling there. I'm like, okay, yeah, I'm ready, man. I knew this was happening. I'm ready for it. And guy calls. We talk for past an hour. And it worked. Like it, it just went really smooth. They were looking for someone to like take care of the coffee shop because um, they got too much on their plate already. So they wanted someone to like, like teach the the new guys, the the staff, how to work coffee. So it just everything lined up so ridiculously. Like the, I, it just. I, I never even send up my, my CV or anything. Like just with these guys' recommendation and talking to the guy for an hour, they were like, Can you be here in two weeks? Like hold up. Like, hold up. It's like, yeah, I want this, but two weeks is just no time. I have to work my way into like just moving out of the other extreme of the country that I live on. And just send my stuff all the way to the north, which is um, where I'm from. And I just, just give me a bit more time. So I tried to negotiate for like a month. They're like, no, man, you got, you have to make it shorter. <laughs> it's like, okay, three weeks. So we, we uh, end up shaking hands as a figure of speech for three weeks. And that was two weeks ago. <laughs> No, that was a week ago. Uh, it's feel like two weeks, but <laughs> it was a week ago. So yeah, everything's changing pretty fast. I'm excited about it. I'm nervous, but and I knew it was it was gonna happen. I felt it since since the beginning. Word of mouth, man. So without any formal interview or three four rounds of interviews, your friend is so loyal or trustworthy, honest, that they just took his word. Man, this is happening a lot in society, isn't it? Like when we go to Amazon, first thing we look at is reviews. Airbnb, reviews. Uber, reviews, right? Like, I mean, maybe not Uber so much because you use the order, but like basically every single thing you look at reviews. And when your friend tells you something, like for example, Jameson, when I need something, anything at all, especially if it's health related, I don't search shit, bro. I WhatsApp Jameson. I give him a voice note or I write, write. I'm like, hey, man, I need this. Find the best one. And usually he knows because he's already found it for himself. So he's like, buy this. And dude, I don't even think. I just buy it. So having a trustworthy tool human right but then we also have ai now right i don't know if you've been playing with chat gpt this this but, but you heard about it for sure right? and uh so so in afro d uh imran he's uh really training our guys on chat gpt and he's like okay you know copywriting and uh choosing thumbnail titles for youtube videos and just like chat gpt chat gpt me on the other hand i'm like nah i'm good man like that shit's gonna eat my soul. I, yeah, there's a balance. You know, you you have Chad GPT spit something out and then you like modify it, like kind of massage it. But I don't know, man, it takes the purity away. I'm more of a traditional conservative type mentality in this, or maybe I just have too much trust in myself and in like my capabilities. So I played with it for a couple of hours. I like, nah, I'm good. Nah, I'm good. You guys can do whatever you want. I'm not gonna touch that stuff. So, where do you, what, what are your feelings about human to human interaction? Where it's like giving advice, trust, like seeing someone and making eye contact and touching them and hugging them versus sort of where society's, you know, headed 
where cell phones in our hand, you know, wake up, go in the bathroom with a cell phone. Uh, um, you're at a cafe waiting for a line, you know, getting your coffee, you're on your phone. Like, where do you see this, especially being a barista and you're seeing this all the time, you're interacting with people all the time. Do you see that there's a sense of lost connection or maybe it's more connection? Before that, I just want to go back to a subject that, that you brought up um, a while ago that I just forgot about, which is like, how do you mediate mediate how much you give to people and 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 how much you like you pour yourself into them and and just back and just like as you mentioned like you you feel Jameson as a just like a support for you for me that's that's what's all about just surrounding yourself with the people that you know that are on the Maybe not the same page as you, but that understand your love languages and that care about them and feel care when, whenever you do what you do and whenever you reach out to them. So I think that it's not about knowing how much, but just being yourself and surrounding yourself with the people that actually feel like you. Because it's not, it's not about thinking anymore. So... That's for that. And um, coming back to the subject of connection and uh, communication, I think there's a couple of things that I see with like, yeah, it, it's impossible to not talk about communication and, and about new generations. It's not, it, it's just, it comes hand in hand. And I think there's a lot of uh, pros I think there's definitely a really heartwarming and human aspect to it. You know, you, you're able to talk to your family in Pakistan in no time. Like, it's just in, in this instantaneous. And like you get to talk to your, like, maybe people that you might not get the chance to see again. So that's beautiful. And, and it brings us closer as humans but yeah it could bring us apart as well it could be distracting from um from human interaction it could it could be but at the at the end it, it's a tool so we all use it as it suits like <laughs> yeah i do think and i'm part of this <laughs> i wake up and the first thing i do is just yeah snoo snooze the alarm and checked on my notifications or emails or messages or whatnot. I don't think it's all healthy. I don't. But I think there's an aspect to this new generation that we didn't have before, which is taking everything apart and trying to be as assertive as you can, like communication-wise. Okay, you're feeling... Cause at least in, in my experience and the way I grew up, there wasn't any explaining about much things. I'm pretty sure there was the first person in my line of family that went to therapy. Straight up. So back <laughs> back in the day, it was just, no, I get mad easily. I, I get triggered easily. That's just the way I am. It's just... Well, you could change that if you want it. So I think that a perk that comes with all of this like, globalization about communication and mental health and, and just, um, I think it's, it's opened a lot of discussions. It's brought, it's, it, it's brought a lot of discussions to the table and that kids and uh, just young people are more informed what they uh, decide to do with it uh, it's a different story but I think there's definitely a lot to learn from them because in my interaction with them it's usually they will usually be more aware of their feelings yeah maybe they'll, they'll get just too much into detail 
or, or just at some point only care about that like it, it's just it gets tricky because you have to know yourself you have to know like okay that upset me but why did it upset me like is it because i think that that's wrong or that's just not aligned with the way i think or so i think there's more awareness in that it like in that uh, realm now got it you mentioned something very interesting and uh I, I I love this topic, which is uh, love languages, and uh, I probably discovered this maybe nine nine eight nine years ago. This concept of a love language, you know, there's this a book, uh, the five love languages or something like that, and every time, uh, like I, I am in a relationship, like when I start a relationship, I make the girl take this test. It's, I need to know what her love language is, right, and. A lot of people may not be aware of this concept, but it's very important because the way different people feel love is different from their personality and how they see the world and culturally, right? How their parents see the world, you know? How they... And so have you like consciously used the love language concept? I guess I have, but not in like maybe telling someone, you know what, I have to uh, feel these, th you have to do this and this and that. But I guess I, I definitely have. Maybe just not label labeling as that. But there's definitely a component whenever you're, you start to like just identify your needs as a person as a as a human and, and just like interaction and you're craving i this is what i love about therapy that you sort of identify your needs by what they are it's not hey, i'm just a little sad and cuddly well yeah but like just elaborate on that okay well maybe i'm just feeling down because of work and or maybe I'm just hangover and just want to be spooned. But like, you start to identify your needs without being just needy and, well, needy, I think it's it's a bit of an upscale word because, yeah, there might be someone that feels that you're not needy. It's just like the amount of uh, caring that you need. So I don't think needy is, is it's the proper word to use, but... I just love that you start to identify what you need and you can speak out to your partner or partners and and just lay it on the table and but no one told us how to do that. No one told you that yeah, you might be upset, you might be mad, but why are you feeling that? Like upset because of what? What made you feel angry? What made you feel jealous? Is it fear of losing your partner? Is it insecurities? Is it... So I think that, yeah, I, it's really important to just dig in deep in ourselves and, and just find what we need from a partner, from a friend, because we, we don't usually talk about love languages with other people than our partners. But it's, it's all there. It's human interaction. It, it's, it's love. Like, every interaction that you... Oh, my bad. Every interaction is just about being a little bit less selfish, more empathic, empathetic, and just just being aware that we're sharing this world with everyone and make it a good experience out of it. Yeah. You know, you said uh, we only share the love language with our partners. I once made my mom and dad <laughs> filled this out. I was there uh, when we were in Euless, uh from the last year, March to June. We were there for f three months. And um, I, I, I had my, my mom, um, I was asking her questions about, you know, the love language from her love language. And, and then I had my, and then I, there was like a test where um, it was like, 
it, it, it. So I was asking my mom and it all worked out. Like, you know, my mom like got it. Then I asked my dad and dude, the guy had no, like the brain wiring didn't even exist for this. And so, so I was like, so dad, um, do you, do you like, uh, to be, um, do, do you like to hug? You know, this was a test of like physical, you know, how much you care about physical, which, which is my top love language, you know, physical, um, uh, touching, like physical stuff. Are you seeing? <laughs> and then number two is uh, time together. Um, and then it, 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 and then it's acts of service and, and so on. So it's like, uh, for, for my dad, I was, I would ask her, so dad, uh, do you like to be, uh, hugged or some, some question like that? And, and dude, he asked me like five questions. He's like, by who? Like by mom or uh, by someone else? Uh, um, like, where am I when I'm getting hugged? Like he was like over here. And I was like, dad, this is just simple questions. And dude, it, 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 it really, uh, um, like it, it, it was stressful for me because I was like, fuck my, you know, my own dad doesn't. And then at the end, you know what happened? The, I got the, got the test done. All the results came. And then I told my mom, my mom was like, no. Go, go ask dad if he answered this for himself or some hypothetical person. So I went to my dad. I'm like, uh, so dad, uh, when I was asking you this, like, were you feeling your own? Uh, so he goes, he goes something like, no, I was uh, like, if somebody was asked this, this is what they would say. I was like, what? Right. And, and actually this, this topic came, came up with Catherine too. C Catherine mentioned that, uh, th this is like one of the most profound things. She goes, Farhan, you know, when someone asks us, how, how are you doing? How are you doing today? How are you doing right now? We usually talk about like how our day is going or like I went here or I did. No, 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 no. That's not important. How are you feeling right now? That's a tough one. Because now you have to be fully aware of your own feelings and then being able to reveal them to someone else. So yeah, man, this is a... Uh... And one thing I... Th this is also uh, something I wanted to ask you. Just like every single person has a different experience of Tulum, right? Some people have left Tulum because like a lot of shit happened like a scooter got stolen. One of our buddies in Digital Jungle, right? Like scooter got stolen. Another scooter got stolen. A cops gave a 4,000 peso fine. Like all, and then in one week. So the guy's gone, right? Or like I got bid by the chichin thing and whatever, you know, the, 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 the plant, the tree, yeah. Or, um, or some sickness happened, a rash happened, uh, you know, this and that, I got screwed over. What has your experience been with Tulum? How long you've been here to in total? And, uh, would you recommend, like, what type of person would be good here? Well, it's um, it's fair to say that it's my second time in Tulum. And this time, I kind of knew what I was coming from. Like, I, I know what it was going to be like. I mean, not the details, but I had an idea. Last time I was here was uh, 2017, and it was way different. It was way different with super chilled, um, tourism was mostly European. They were coming for the Siankan Reserve. So it was mostly ecotourism. It just came and lay at the beach. Yeah, there was a couple of like big, uh, big fancy hotels, but not as many as uh, there's, there's today. And so I knew. I knew at that point. And actually, I saw it changing so much within a year, the year that I was here, that I knew that like the big like construction companies were coming and i knew that tourism would change at some point and so this time around it was no surprise it was just what i thought it was going to be a lot of construction going on you know you have the prices as if you were living in a big city but without the infrastructure to actually back it up so it and the electrical is... Yeah, I mean, you get power uh, blackouts, you get uh, running water, out of running water, it's just... Yeah, I mean, it's the basic stuff. And 
you know, like you're in one of the nicest neighborhoods. So imagine what happens in like the the working class neighborhoods. There's times that they go out of water for weeks. Yeah. So and I came here to work and to connect to connect with people and that that has worked so far. But I knew what I was um coming to. Uh, my experience, it, it's a beautiful place. I love it. Don't get me wrong. It's not that I'm saying don't come to Tulum. There's definitely a lot of worlds intertwining. A lot of things intertwining. And there's a whole different scheme for, like, every single layer of it. It's just like a like a big kombucha <laughs> uh, organism just with, with a lot of layers to it and kombucha is i'll say the perfect uh, figure of speech for tulum <laughs> so yeah i think there's a lot going on and at the end if you find your crowd you'll be fine if you find a support network you'll be fine but it's not always the case sometimes you get into a spiral and things start to happen and it's just one after another, 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 and it just spits you out. And that's for foreigners as for Mexican people. So I have a lot of friends that have come to the Maya Riviera to work and they've just spiraled down and just been spit out. Spit out. Yeah. So it's it's a bit chaotic. Like you can get into like just some chaos. But it could also be beautiful. It could also be really, like, chill and life-changing. And you could meet some amazing people and and just, as myself, use it as a, as a portal to go somewhere else. Because you get to meet people from so many different background stories, so many different lifestyles. Some of them follow the cliches, uh, but at the end, it's just enriching how many people there is and how different they are to you. And, and if you're just open to listen and learn, you can learn a lot of things. I, I want to, you mentioned the kombucha layers. I want to nerd out a little bit with you. Um, so obviously I drink kombucha. I drank coffee all my life. The last maybe seven weeks, you know, zero coffee. I'm doing an experiment and, and it's all good. But I love coffee and I love cold brew. I mean, I love all, all that stuff, right? As you know, you you, you know, you serve some wonderful coffee and cold brew and so on, I remember. Um, and so let's nerd this out a little bit because before we get into coffee, let's go to kombucha because we talked about it, just mentioned it. When someone drinks kombucha, you just like drinking this thing. And obviously different kombuchas are very different. And, but what, what are the layers of kombucha and what's like, what's the, what, what is so cool about it to you? For me, it's that it's a live organism and you're basically just getting good bacteria into your your person, your gut. Because at the end, um, we don't actually do most of our digestion. It's a bacteria. So we actually take on the work of the bacteria that lives in our gut, but most of the work is done by bacteria. It's not us. It's not us as or as an organism. It's a complexity of, of systems working within systems. So for me, it's the opportunity to get something really tasty. Uh, I love that like funkiness to it. I love that like sourness, that vinegar note. And at the same time, just take care of your body. Got it. And 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 that and then uh, going back to coffee, th this is a, a a big topic because, I mean, as you know, the number one drug that most people are addicted to in the world, or not most, but like the most popular drug is caffeine by far, by far, and coffee is the way most people consume caffeine, and you're a barista, so you're a drug dealer, makes you a drug dealer, man. How do you feel about that? Well, I, I'll say that maybe sugar is top. Maybe sugar is top of the list. It's true, eh? 
And um, but yeah, I I totally get it. I am a drug dealer. Don't quote me on this. Get this out of context. But yeah, I I mean, coffee is just such a broad spectrum. And for me, what's beautiful about it is that, just as you said it, most people in the world have a ritual about coffee. Some people do it in the morning. Some people do it in the afternoon. Some people do it to just wake up by necessity. Some people do it for social reasons. Some people do it before they go to bed. So it's a ritual. And for me, as someone to get the permission or to be asked to, to be part of that ritual for them, in there every morning and and because we have a lot of customers that okay they they go they visit the place it's a beautiful spot and they just keep on going and they go every day of their stay over here i've had families that basically just i'm, I'm opening at eight and, and they're just waiting outside because we become a part of the the experience because at the end it's that it's about the experience. So they invite you into their ritual, which is having coffee. And if you do it well, and if you do it passionately enough, as I myself consider it like passionate for coffee, they'll just invite you in and they'll just make you part of their daily routine. And for me, that's, that's a privilege. Like you're getting into someone's daily routine and maybe they're learning from you. You're um, learning from them. You're talking. You're exchanging stories, life stories. For me, that's what it's all about. Like people think that they have a good time in the coffee and talking to me. I'm learning from you. I should be paying you. <laughs> so... That's one of the things that I love about it. I'm a really talkative person, as you might have seen. But I really enjoy this feedback. But getting to know people, I truly care about people. And I think that when people don't feel, they don't feel overwhelmed by that, they reciprocate. And, and I, just like you, man, I, I met you serving you coffee. So if people are receptive enough, you you start like just bonding with them because it's, it's a sacred ritual. It's just serving food, serving, if you see it from not the, just uh, the transactionary part of it, then you're being fed, you're being uh, served something that will cheer you up it's not about service. It's not about doing it, like just putting the fork in the right way. And mm -hmm. it's about doing it with love. It's just as, as if you were at your grandma's house and she was just giving you something to eat as they usually do. Yeah, a lot of stuff. What about rude customers? As a person who's positive and vulnerable, and happy, you must have had some experiences where maybe you felt something and you maybe didn't want to be there. What do you do? Like, you can't start doing therapy with them. No, you can't. That's not what they want. Um, well, I've, I've had a lot of like, ugly encounters with people. Yeah, I mean, I've been working in coffee for like, eight years at this point, um, maybe 10. Yeah, but the first one doesn't count because he wasn't like very aware of coffee, but it was just interacting with people. But yeah, you get a lot of like, Mexico City, man. Oof, oof. I, I get asked um, to just fight up a guy one time. It's like, you want to fight? You want to go outside? You Yeah, he was lit like that. Old guy, full suit. Really? 
He was so stressed, man. You could tell he got in front of the line. There was a lot of people waiting. He got in front of the line. He was just entitled. Yeah, super entitled. And I guess that I was triggered that time. I, I was. So I just asked my coworker to just uh, keep on talking to him. Because the guy got in my face and he was like super physical. So he was like just putting his hands right here. Damn. So I had to get away from, I had to walk away from that one because I was getting triggered. So I just um, told my coworker to take it from there. But it's usually to just switch it to neutral. It's just, okay, you're not being that um, attentive because, you know, it'll trigger them because they're, they're in a bad mood. And whatever you do, they'll take it the wrong way. Yeah. So you try to stick to the neutral thing. It's, this is not even like a manual or anything. It's just the way I, I deal with it. You stick to the basics. You're just polite enough. Not overdo yourself. It's just what it is. And there's the chance that something would happen and that you will change that. And that they'll mellow down and just get more receptive uh, to like through the treatment, through the way that you treat them. It's not always the case, but it happens. And when it does, I've had people apologizing for the attitude when, whenever they got there. A lot of people is like, you know, I'm sorry, I was so stressed out. Uh, I know it's not your fault. So going back to like people's um, psychology is just, some people are just not used to being treated right, to being like care about, to being they don't know how to deal with. It. Some of, some people don't. It's like this guy's faking it, or this guy wants yeah. something from me. Yeah. So that's a good surprise. Whenever that happens, it's like yeah, I'm just like yeah, I was just trying to be nice, you know. It's, I'm not working the tips out or anything. It's, but yeah, uh, yeah, there's definitely that. And I'm I'm pretty sure that I'm going to experience that a lot over there in Bahamas. Right. So it'll be more multicultural there, you think? It's a different type of tourism. It's what you will call ugly Americans. It's the yes. It's the the cruise ship people. It's just and like not to pull labels or anything, but yeah, I mean there's Usually, the, the and, and this will get us into a whole, a uh, whole another topic. For me, whenever I travel, I like to experience the local culture. I like to experience their food. I like to experience the way they live. So, if I can just rent a space that resembles what a local family will live like, that suits me the best. Some people don't want that. Some people want to just have a repeatable, uh, comfortable experience, but the same experience that they will have in the States or in Bahamas or in Dubai. So they just want to feel the comfort of, of just, okay, I know that if I sell in this um, hotel chain, I know where the, the remote is. I know where my water bottle is. Yeah, so, and that's fine. That's not the way I do it. So I think that it's a common thing for people to get used to whatever they have, um, where they're from. It's like the kind of services, the, the kind of treatment, language, that's a big one. So I think people get used to it and start to expect and demand that wherever they are. So that's one of the reasons why I'm here. If I wasn't fluent in English, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't have been given this opportunity to go to Bahamas. So I know I'm, I'm part of that. I'm part of that um, 
like gentrification problem. But uh, there's a demand for it. So there's people that want to feel the same way, whether they're in Tulum, whether they're in Cambodia, whether they're wherever. And I think that that kind of travel doesn't enrich you as much. Like, it doesn't give you the experience of the place, doesn't... Yeah, and how you grow. Exactly. And for me, traveling, it's about learning from people, not just taking a beautiful picture. You know, coffee. Back to this, uh, it's very, very fascinating because when someone has a cup of coffee that they're drinking, they are not aware of where it came from, how it's made, right? We believe that, oh, what barista? Like, what are you talking about? It's easy. You just like take a thing, you put the thing, blah, 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 and boom, and then the coffee comes out and you drink it, and then that's it. What's the big deal? What is this? Why is it even a word, barista? It doesn't even make sense. So there are people like that, right? And and so take us through, because I know you what, before going to the Bahamas, you're going to go somewhere else and look at some coffee fields. And so that experience, 99.9% .9 of people will never have or even think about, like, oh, there's like coffee fields? That's so cool. So sort of give us an overview of, of what the process is from a coffee bean to a cup of coffee? Well, first of all, I'm still going to Colombia. It's just going to be a short, way shorter trip than than expected. But I managed to um, have my flights to, to Bah Bahamas from there. So I, I'm i still like hopeful that I'll get to, to see those fields. And the thing with coffee is just like with food, people and I think that's changing, but for the most part, people don't know that there's a, a layer to that. They just see the back. Some of, some people don't even know that they're beans. It's just like, no, co coffee is just this dust that comes in the bag. and From the sky, yeah. it rains. It lands in, in the store, in the convenience store, and I just get it from there, and that's it. There's a lot of markets. There's a lot of different markets. There's a lot of different qualities, just like anything else. And it's fine. I'm not seeing that some are best than others. There's definitely a layer of uh, technicality, but the usual process is that you get the beans, which are, which resemble like a cherry. And they just show up in a plant, like it's there? Yeah, I mean, they, they actually, at this point, it's all, well, it came to Latin America because of, of like slavery. Most of the varietals of coffee come from uh, Africa. Most of them come from Kenya. Yes. So if, if actually if you go to Kenya and try to export coffee, they'll be really tricky about it because um, there's some like real secrets going on there. And they're really protective about coffee. It's their basically the biggest national income. So came with the slaves. Uh, the fields were actually the weather was um, was suitable for coffee. So they started growing in the big haciendas and the big plantations. You talking about Colombia here or generally Latin America? Generally, yes. Uh, it, it has to be a uh, certain height. Has to be about uh, above nine hundred meters. Really? Yes. Or it will die, the plant, or it won't grow as it won't grow. Yeah, it, it needs that um, that um, temperature ranges and sun, humidity. It's really, really capricious. Like a, it's a microclimate that they need to be in. Like these really consistent climate so and it grows like in the in the wild basically it could but i mean they, they basically like made it like just fields and just line the rows and then some people still do it in a traditional way and just like the side of the mountains and stuff like that mm -hmm. uh, 
their assault ranges for plantations, from the big industrialized ones to the family ones that have just maybe 100 square meters in the side of that mountain, maybe 50 square meters in that one over there. And they work in the side of the mountain, just carry everything by in their bags. So, But can you make an artificial coffee thing? Meaning, like, for example, let's say a country, I don't know if there's a country like that, it's like there's no way the coffee is going to grow here. Maybe it's not, there's no 900 meters, the temperature is fucked up, like it's always snowing, like who knows. Could they still grow coffee, like in an artificial way? Or that would be really bad? Because the Chinese can do anything. If, yeah, I, I, yeah, if you talk about could, they, I mean, yeah, it could be done. Everything could be done. Okay. Under controlled circumstances. But... I don't think it'll be sustainable, like um, money-wise. I think it'll be a really costly operation because coffee, as it is, the cherry is not as pricey, and that's when when you get in the trouble to like, okay, well, you get these really fancy cafes uh, selling a, a cup of coffee for six, seven, eight dollars. How much of that gain? Is the farming getting? So that's where you get. It. Well, the process for coffee is like this: you get the plants, and uh, they start producing after seven years. Well, it depends on the varietal, but usually start uh, producing after six or seven years. So that that's when they they start to make a profit. And then you see the bean, like yeah, it's sort like of like the fruit of the plant. Yeah, it it blossoms. Oh, it's like a cherry, like a red cherry. Yes. Yeah, it blossoms and there's like, you know, the a flower, just like any other plant and uh, like any other fruit. Uh, it gets pollinated, then comes a fruit. And there's like this, um, I don't know how to say it in English, but like the way that um, grapes uh, grip in the, in, the, in the vine. So there's not as much like, so they just grew up around the branch and they pick it out and this is where it starts to separate. So the bean is inside the cherry? It is. One bean? No, it's two beans because it's like half. Yeah, exactly. And each bean has the potential to become a plant. Because it's a seed? Yes. Wow. So it's like the two seeds between the, in the cherry. And this is where it starts to separate because you have different markets which ask you for different things. The usual market, the volume market, they don't care. They just want coffee. So it doesn't matter if you... Like the instant coffee shit. Yes. It doesn't matter if you pick out the ones that are not ripe enough or ripe yet. So just take everything. But they'll still have caffeine. Yes. And and maybe um, there's not even people doing it anymore. Maybe that's just big, uh, big fields. With machines just taking out the cherries from the uh, from the plants, and then what do you do with the rest of the cherry? Can you eat it? You could, and whenever it's fresh, it's actually really good, like it really tasty. It's got this um, sugar to it. There's a, a layer of like viscous. Um, well, it's the sugars that that the seed is feeding on to be able to to produce or to be. Um, it's like the womb. Yeah, exactly. Like, like a baby growing. Yes. So there's these uh, sugars in it. So whenever you're in a coffee field and you're picking out, you can just have a few and just spit out the seeds and you're actually helping out to spread the, the, coffee, uh, the coffee field. And that's basically what the trick is for the plant for, for it to proliferate in, in nature. So animals will eat the, the cherries will shit out the, the seeds and that's a way because animals are there walking around are there what about like pesticides and sprays and organic versus non-organic whatever it's just like any other food or any other other product there's definitely a lot of layers and markets so different markets um ask for different things uh, different qualities different uh, norms certifications so after you pick out the seed, fair trade, I think there's something like that. Yeah, there is, there is, and and for me that's the way to go. 
for a coffee to be sustainable and then to produce better tasting and and to just make justice for like these people have been doing since slavery. Is that what fair trade means? It is. You balance the money? Yes. Wow. You skip out the middlemen, which usually gets the, the gains without working their asses off as farmers do. And you make a fair price for what you sell it for and for what you get it from the, the farmer. And is, is it pretty drastic? Like, you know, for Apple and iPhones, you have these slave markets in, in, in China with the people are trying to commit suicide and they won't let them because there's a trampoline. You know, there's all this, what's called Foxconn, right? The, the Apple uh, factory. Is this certain thing in coffee too? Or is it a lot of exploitation happening? A lot. I mean, we're talking about a crop that originated from slavery. And that's, or we would have never had it here, right? Like they, the, basically you're saying that when, this, when, when African-Americans came to the West through slavery, they knew how to grow the coffee. So they did it here or, or, or the, the, the owner said, hey, you know how to do it, do it here. I think it was more like we're growing this because it works over here. We, we need like labor for it. So bring all the, the slaves and, and just work the plantations as any other like cane sugar plantations or sugar cane. Yeah. So you got this. <laughs> I'm just digressing so bad over here. You get this seed from the cherry. And if you pick out the, the only the ripe ones and you start selecting from there, it becomes one quality, really high quality. If you're selling bulk, to just pick out whatever. In the Walmart. Yeah. So after you pick it out, you let it to ferment. Some people wash it before. Some people give it a little rinse, get rid of um, any like small box or dirt or the excess of sugar from the, from the cherries. And they set it to ferment. They could do it in like, like we call it costales, which are like the bags that seed usually comes in or that um, flour comes in. So when you say ferment, like keeping in a dark place without like Closed. oxygen, yeah. Yes, there's different types of, um, of um, fermentation, but the most usual one is they just close it back and let it sit for, it could range from 24 hours to 72, depending on what they're, what they're going for. There's different processes. But the, the Walmart cheap one won't, they don't do that ferment. No, but you have to, you oh. have to, it's just like um, cacao. You have to uh, ferment it and then roast it in order to become what it is and, and, and for, it, for it to get a, a, a flavor block, uh, profile. So you have to do it. Otherwise it, it won't taste like, like we're used to. Huh, that's so interesting. Maybe, maybe this is one of the reasons why coffee is known as an antioxidant. Maybe this fermentation process helps in some way. Yes, at the end you're transforming the sugars in it and you're using it to preserve a bit and it definitely, the, the way you choose to, to take your process definitely affects, I, I won't say change because nothing that is not on the, on the bean will show on cup. So the flavors have to be there. You can either enhance them or just uh, mute them a little bit but nothing that is not on the bean will shop in cup. So you can choose your profile from those, uh, those stages. And after you ferment it, then you let it to, um, to dry, let it to dry. And there's, again, there's so many techniques to it. Some people just do it out in their yards or there's, um, these, uh, invention called the African bed which is um, basically um, a wood frame. And um, what's it called? Like this um, like net that um, would just allow the, the airflow from underneath and... Like a mesh wire? Yeah, like a mesh. Yeah, that, that was a word. That was so cool. cool, okay. So they just can pile them up so you can um, like dry a lot in a, in a small space. That's really handy. 
and it, it's a controlled way to do it. So you it's real temperature. temperature. Exactly. Humidity. So whenever you're um, going for like really good coffee, you have to control every aspect of it. You have to control the temperature that your uh, beans uh, dry at, the temperature that they reach uh, during fermentation. So that's when people start to get like creative about it. And they start to tweak things and they maybe will add some, um, um, I just lost the word. Whenever you're doing bread, yeast, they, they'll add some different yeast to it. So it ferments in another way, gets another like, like funkiness, like some different uh, flavors. So yeah, man. so after that process, you dry it out, it has to re uh, reach a certain percentage of humidity. It's uh, between 10 and 12%. It depends on what you're doing. If you're exporting, you maybe want, want it to be a little bit more humid or a bit more dry. And whenever the, the roaster get it, it'll be like in the amount that they, they need it to. And after the, the drying, and you get the, the roasting. And, and so this is a really labor-consuming uh, chain and, and time-consuming. And you can spoil everything in, in every single step of the chain. So even if you get like a really good coffee that was harvested the best way, uh, fermented, super controlled, and roasted in a beautiful way. What is roast? They just put it in... Um, this is basically like, it's not an oven, it, it's... A kind of cookie? Yes. I mean, they, they use, uh, some of them use convection. Some of them use um, hot air. So it depends on, on it's... Then again, it, it becomes a cultural thing. Some people do it in comales, just like in, in, in clay comales. And they'll just move the uh, beans around until they look good. That's it. Some people go really technical on it, just measuring percentages, like the curves. There's this thing called a curve for whenever they're roasting. So they have to profile the flavors that they want to um, enhance. So you know, at a certain temperatures, the sugars come up. So you have to play with it. You have to fiddle it to get what you think is the best profile for that bean. And after browsing, it's basically ready for uh, retail or to hit the coffee shop. But it's been, yeah, like five processes at that, at that point from picking out. And then there's this, so I, I'm not so much of a cappuccino latte guy. I just double espresso, cold brew. That's, I'm good. That's, I'll drink this for the rest of my life. I'm, I'm good. But then in, in, I guess this is Italian culture, I'm assuming, uh, or maybe it came from Africa or me. I don't know the, the origin of it, but this cappuccino and latte and, you know, these different things that, that are going on with coffee. What is it? Like, what's the, who, where did all this come from? Like, you know, you know, and then now, like almond milk and all these different types of milk, and that shit is nasty, man. Like, I, I know I've had cappuccino and lattes like with normal milk, you know, like the shitty milk, whatever people say. But then like whenever I've had it with any other milk, it's so bad. It does, does not work. Like the foam doesn't work. None of, you know, the frother is like, is not made for that. So tell us like, what is this culture of, of like getting a latte and like, at a Starbucks? And is this very recent? Or is this a, like a real thing? This Well, it's definitely real. <laughs> well, it definitely is for what we know, right? But it's not recent. Uh, I mean, the word latte just means milk. Uh, macchiato is just means stained with milk. So this is our, the, these are all uh, Italian words. And the espresso is actually Italian. I mean, yeah, coffee, there's a lot of ways to drink coffee. But espresso, 
was invented in Italy. So, like the actual process, yeah, the yeah, pressure, yeah. the machine, exactly the pressure, the temperature, the extraction rates. That's it. So Italy would get all this from Africa way back in the day, because uh, they don't grow any coffee. Can't. Yeah. So most people say like Italian coffee is the best, but where are the fields? <laughs> is it really Italian? Uh, and in Africa, is the whole country very perfect for coffee, or is like Ethiopia might be one? Or... It's it's a ring of um, of nations that are actually really big on coffee. It's Ethiopia. It's um, Kenya. It's one of the biggest. It's a whole ring in Africa that is really big in in coffee production. And at the end, Yemen is one of the parts where it originates. Coffee culture comes from Yemen. A lot of it. Um, there's uh, this story about uh, a little shepherd called um, Kaldi, which uh, discovered that his goats were munching on something and they will get really hyper, really, really hyper. So he was like, okay, well, what's that? So he started like just trying to see it and, and found out that it was... Um, okay. Yeah, basically. <laughs> But it was basically cocaine, and and so he started brewing, he started making tests, and then just end up having coffee. So it's one of the like myths of, uh, around coffee origin that this guy, this farmer, this shepherd noticed that his goats were getting really hyper on this cherry, so he started using it and trying it, and find out that it was uh, an upper. So all, all of these um, beverages at the end are then again cultural. It's, um, it makes a lot of sense because espresso is like a really concentrated uh, e extract. It's an extraction. So at the end, it's, it's been through a lot of pressure and temperature. So it's harsh, mostly, mostly. It's harsh, so flavors in it are more towards the bitters if it was if it's well balanced it's it could be a lot of like complexity to it but it's usually or what italians were used to it's there's a lot of um of bitterness to it a lot so you can basically just taste the roast you know there was something really roasted and so whenever you add milk to it you cut down a lot on the bitterness you add sugars from the lactose and it basically it's the perfect marriage so you add sweetness a bit of acidity and lots like it just blends together really well yeah so the school of coffee that i that i'm in it's an espresso has to be more like that more than that it, it has to be complex it has to have acidity you have you have to be able without the milk just on its own yes on its own you have to be able to taste the the plant part of it you have to like feel some of that like herbal notes you have to be able to f find that sweetness from that it's a fruit at the end so if there's sweetness left it, it talks about a good process a caring process so for me, and this is an opinion, uh, there's always like people that like other things, but for me, a good espresso has to be balanced, has to have acidity, has to have a uh, complexity, has to have bitterness to it. And if it's a bit fruity, I love it. Yeah, yeah. most people just find it confusing because it's like, what the hell is this? This is not, just, this is not espresso. Yeah, it's supposed to taste like coffee, like, but I, I love it when it when it's fruity. Speaking of stuff in coffee that might be uh, strange for some people, let's talk about mold. So um, bulletproof coffee, right? This is from Dave Asprey. Uh, I used to follow him way back in the day before he became a bit crazy. But but the bulletproof coffee concept is simply coffee has mold. Mold can grow in coffee, so you need to get organic coffee. That's the first step. Second step is mix it with MCT oil 
or butter or something and then blend it, right? So is, I, 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 never, re I re never really figured out if this was a real thing or not, but how careful are you with your coffee? If it's not organic, do you, what, what do you do? What's the truth here? First of all, it has to be fresh. I mean, mold comes with time. And if you poorly process something and ends up being backed for a year, you'll most likely have some kind of mold. And adding to that, if it's been roasted for a year, it's basically lost everything that was in it. The aroma, the antioxidants, at that point it's just gone. There's a window whenever you roast where coffee is at its best, at its peak. It's between five days of roasting and maybe 15, three weeks tops. Depending on the, on the beans, of course, there's some exceptions, but if you let coffee that it's been roasted already sit for that long, to start with, you'll lose everything that you want in coffee. Basically, but the caffeine might still be there. The caffeine might. A lot still of people just give a shit about that. Yeah, it's like, oh, this yeah. could be as nasty as possible. I just want the caffeine, like taking a pill or something. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. The caffeine will remain there, but not everything else from like from an enjoyable experience point of view. And yeah, for example, the coffee that I'm working with right now, it's really good. The the roaster even has his own farm, so he's even producing coffee now. And he's really meticulous with his processes and he does, he does a really good job, really good job. And you can tell on, on the way they pack, on the way they're roasted, they're selected. Cause at the end you open a bag of coffee and if the beans are like all uneven, some of them are like really light, uh, lightly roasted, those are called defects and, and you know that if there's a lot of defects, there's not like good quality control. So those are some of the things that you have to just be aware of and just try to get fresh as possible. Most people don't even look at, uh, at this in the, in the grocery store because most brands don't actually uh, display the, the day of roasting, but good coffees will, will do. They'll brag on, okay, this is freshly roast. So whenever you see someone or a label displaying the, the roasting date, that's the bag that you want to go for. Very nice. Okay, so there's a, there's a way to detect if a coffee is good before you buy it. That's great, man. I, uh, let's go back to uh, the history of coffee. Uh, not coffee specific, but cafes. I remember reading, I was in Brooklyn at the time, and I was reading about how cafes originated like what happened like the history of cafes and what i read and you can tell me how, what you think about this what i read is that the first cafe originated in austria in vienna and the purpose of this cafe was simply to bring in people from all walks of life right it could be a garbage man with a doctor, with a businessman, with a scientist, with an office worker, with a housewife, like it was mostly men at the time, but I mean, it could be anybody, right? And without caring about hierarchy and uh, wealth, there's a debate. There's a debate about politics, religion, society, philosophy, science, like just a debate going on. And, and this is where the, the, the sort of the concept of cafe came from. Now you take that type of beautiful environment where we are free to, you know, it's egalitarian. We're free to express, you know, freedom of speech for real versus today in a cafe. What do you see? How do you, do you draw any differences and have you been in cafes which actually have this type of ambiance? Well, um, the the story that I've um, 
that I've read about goes along the same lines, but for me it makes a little bit more sense because what I've read is that it originated in a Middle East. So you got the uh, Yemen, you got cities like this that are like really big, really uh, populated with a Muslim, um, with under under the Muslim uh, religion, they can't have alcohol. So this is a beverage that um, lubricates the the social com um, the, this. I just lost my voice right now. You have this um, this beverage that lubricates uh, the social in like interactions. Let's have a call. And it brings people to debates, and and it brings people to be passionate about something. They're hyped. They're they're energized about, and, and they're opinionated. So for me, it has a lot more sense. But I you also say, get that mental kick, right? Yeah, yeah. That that and that sense of like self realization. That as well. It's that's a big one, and and I, I've been in coffees like that. I, I've been in to this day. There's just like there's markets for every quality of coffee, there's a whole range of, co of different types of coffee shops. There's the ones that you have cats and you can pet them. There's the ones that you can just uh, go and rent a computer to just get some work done. There's one like Digital Jungle where I made you that it's just a, a, a workplace, but you have a bit of a cafeteria area. So yeah, there's a whole range of them. And I've been to places where literally just people will go have breakfast and they'll start showing up. They'll they'll start discussing the, the newspaper. And they'll they'll start just uh, throwing opinions and, and you'll have a whole range of You've been in here in Mexico? Yes. In Chihuahua. Yes. And well they'll they'll just start talking about the news and that will just bring another subject and another one, and another politics, religion, and and it ranges from the, the crowd that I used to attend over there, from like um, doctors, uh, people that work law, so um, lawyers, attorneys, and the guy that delivered the paper. So it, it was brought, it was definitely brought, and I was just in the middle of it, just learning. Then it's just one of those experiences that you learn a lot from, and people get really passionate about it. That that they will start yelling, they will start, and it's all allowed. Yeah, it's a record. That's that's what coffee bar is for, for, pe for people to interact with each other. For me, at least, that's so interesting, man. You know, uh, when Elon took over Twitter, one of the things he said is he wants to make it a town square, right? express your opinion, kind of get feedback, and kind of everyone has voting rights, and, you know, town square. And when he said that, I was like, wait, that's what a cafe used to be, right? I wanted to ask you, this type of culture that you saw in Chihuahua, multiple cafes, this type of atmosphere I personally have never seen. I know there's a couple of cafes in Toronto that I went to, but it wasn't that vibe. It was like, yeah, you know, a few old people are playing chess or, you know, they're playing cards and they're, but it's not like that open society. So is this like a cultural thing? Where are we right now with this? For example, at Digital Jungle, whenever we were there, it was an open society. Like you could go and chat and have fun and learn. But I haven't found that many places, man. So how can we how can we initiate that? How can we bring that back to the world? Like this cool cafe from the the Austrian times? I think that it's a matter of first of all, like people's personality. Like you can't choose who's gonna visit what place. Well, you can can, but I don't think like you really want to manipulate all the way to there, but I think it depends on the place that you're at. It depends, like for you, for example, being North America, North America is not known for being super open with like people that you don't know and 
I think it happens a lot in Latin America and in, in Middle East because people are like more open. They'll just share a table with a stranger with no issue whatsoever. So I think it, it's a bit of that. I don't know if you want to like get into people's business and just tell them to be more open. I don't think. And and I think that's one of the things that technology might be not contributing in a good way towards. Because I think that people that are not really social just get way more introverted. Just go down that path even more. And that's fine. Like, But everyone has to be super social and talkative. And, but I think it, it draws a line. And I think you just have to find a spot where people are like that, the crowd is like that. But I don't think you can influence that. I think there's so many factors playing over there that I don't think that you can just just play with them until they're right. I think it, like a place gets uh, or tries uh, its crowd and you're kind of subject to it at that point. This made me think of when you were talking about how just the, the passion with which you, the way you talk about coffee, right? It's like, it's you, it's your shit, right? And we haven't yet gotten into like the, the video photo stuff, right? Like your, 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 your art of, you know, showing the best out of people, you know, by taking photos and videos or the worst. and stuff. Huh? Or, or the worst. worst. Or yeah, best and worst, both. And so the, the, the question is, when did you become aware that this is who you are? Because a lot of people don't have self-awareness. You know, they're in the medical field, but they're extroverted and like they love to make jokes and fuck around and not follow rules. Well, you can't do that in the medical field. You got to follow rules. Whereas other people may be in a, in a you know, like they're hosts of, of things or they, they're receptionists, but they're like very introverted and they hate people. So when did you get this self-awareness? How can a person be self-aware and know what they're good at and not so good at and then pick the right career? That's a tough one because going back to what, what you learn when, when you're growing up, I think it's mostly you're being just fed so many things and ideas that are not even yours just like a like uh, like a belief system and, and you actually like take them from for, for granted and for the truth so i guess that's when it like this like street credibility kicks in and i was a lot an extenuous amount of uh, freedom when i was young so I basically just uh, left my home when I was um, turning 17, 17. So I started to experience my own reality and then just creating and just going about, just getting some money to leave by and, and stuff like that. So I was granted a lot of freedom since a really young age. I wasn't pressured about studying. I wasn't pressured, maybe I should have, I don't know. but. I think that that confidence of just letting me choose my own path led to me just go through life, go through a lot of experiences. And from all of those experiences, speaking out what I was enjoying and just carry on with it. I have many different jobs. I had, I lived in a couple of thousand this point I've started from scratch like three or four times and I really enjoy it I really enjoy this like getting out of the comfort zone and, and start over and get to know new people because I know that I always get a really really good support uh, support network I know that I I'll manage and I I'll get to know the right people wherever I'm at and wherever I get so I think that it took a lot of like trial and error 
and definitely things that came up in my life and that happened told me that I was just more suitable for some things and than, than others and I always knew that I wanted to do something that I enjoyed because because it, it's not even an option for me I, I I'm really bad at pretending that I like something if I don't I'm super bad like I'm transparent you you'll see me being miserable at an office job because I have because I have been so you you can so one thing I've learned is everything worth doing has obstacles and you have to sort of sometimes fight your way into learning something or having success in something or figuring something out. And one sort of hack to not giving up is that you like it. You like the thing. So when you first started eight years ago and you... At that moment, did you know that it, this is it? Like, did you feel that this is your your thing, or you were trying many, many, many things in you know a chaotic way, and then you're like, oh, okay, maybe I'll just do this because this is really cool. That I feel good about this. Well, at least with photography, I did feel that bit of a call. I was really interested in like art and like audiovisual stuff, and. I was doing um, these visuals for for uh, rapes, so I started to just uh, playing with. No, no, no. It was it was back in Chihuahua. Yeah, I was like seventeen or eighteen at the time. So I was just playing with videos and like just interlaying them together, and it became really fun. And I started to just play with cameras and playing effects live, and it was really fun. Then I bought my first camera, and I was hooked. Like, okay, I, I can't draw nor paint, but I can take pictures. So I just went from there. And with coffee, no, it, it's just something that I knew I could do. I got to Mexico City. I've worked in a, in a coffee shop already. So it was something familiar that I could go back to. What I didn't count on it was uh, actually meeting someone that was uh, preparing for a, for a national competition. So... She gave me a job. She started uh, to train me while she was training. So I'll, I'll help her. I'll do her dishes after she was done. She will rehearse uh, her routine, uh, talk about the, the coffee that she was brewing, as if she was uh, talking to the judges. So I started to learn a lot from that, and I started to know that there was something else about coffee that I completely completely ignored and I started to learn I became curious about it became passionate but at the time I, I didn't knew that that it was going to lead me to life as it has because I've been in a lot of places and well everyone drinks coffee and some people like good coffee and like the way I make it so there's a job for me almost in every town. So now I want to talk about a, a, a bit more sensitive issue. And that is stereotypes, right? So when I grew up, I grew up in Texas. And my best friend, my first best friend was Arturo, Mexican guy. And we did ESL together. You know, we were both learning English together. All the, the capitals of the states and all the, you know, states in alphabetical order, singing songs and... Uh, uh, Stuff that even Americans don't know. We were learning that shit in ESL. And as I grew up in, the, in, in Texas, there's multiple stereotypes that I was like brainwashed into thinking, right? What Mexico is, how Mexicans are. And there's a stereotype, stereotype of everybody, right? There's like a Pakistani stereotype, Filipino stereotype, American stereotype. So I want to understand Mexico from the other side. And I also want to understand what is the general Mexican stereotype towards Americans, right? So I'll tell you what I grew up learning about. So what I learned is, okay, uh, Mexican people come to America and they make money and then they go back to their uh, country and then they spend it. And so they don't have to work much because of the exchange rate and all that. This is one thing I learned. Second thing I learned is 
all lawnmowers in America are Mexican. You want a lawnmower guy? It's going to be a Mexican guy. Third thing I learned, stereotype, is all construction workers are Mexican. Everything that is being built is a Mexican guy building it. And it wasn't... Like, look, growing up in America, we get brainwashed, right? It's like, America is the country, the only country in the world. Nothing else exists. And even Canada is like, does, doesn't, who cares about Canada? It's like a, nothing. It's like a part of the U.S. This is literally the, the mentality. And so I grew up like that, right? I grew up, you know, like worshiping the American flag and, you know, singing Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, it's after second grade and in junior high, elementary school, high school. And so I grew up with this thing like, oh, as an American, we become like we are better than Mexicans. We are better than Canadians. We are better than everyone. This is the concept. And so what truth, if any, is there in this? And also the, the, you know, the, the stereotype, oh, Mexicans are lazy. Mexicans are like, you know, lazy. They're just like barely want to work. They, they, don't, they just want to be average. What is the reality of this? And also, how do you see Americans? How do you see it and what is the general stereotype? Well, I wouldn't say that whatever I have to say, it's, it's a reality of anything. It's just my opinion. But I do see a lot of that. And of course, there's stereotypes and there's reasons what stereotypes are, what they are. And, and I actually thought that you, were, you weren't going to say the lazy one. I thought that that's what you meant from the first one. Like, yeah, they go to the States, they work, they, they come ho back home. And I thought that you meant, I was going to interrupt you and, and ask if that was about the lazy world. Sounds smart to me, not lazy, but yeah. Exactly. And, and at the end, I guess my point of view is there's a lot of things wrong with, um, with the country, for sure. Um, yeah. There is definitely this, and more so if you put it in comparison, because it's the the north uh, neighbor. So, lots of us have family that lives in the states. I have a lot of family that lives in the states, in California area, in New Mexico, because I'm from the north of the country. So basically, the border skipped them, and. There's a lot of things that doesn't feel that that don't feel right. Just like the fact that even if like your cousin lives like three hours driving distance from you, he gets to make a living with a job and and, and you can't. And you struggle and you don't make ends meet. So I think that when the system fails you, it's not like giving up, but uh, it's why should I just uh, try all that hard if I'm knowing if I'm not going to achieve what what he can achieve? It's not doable, even if I work my ass off like twenty eight hours a day, eight we uh, eight days a week. It's not gonna happen. So I think there's a lot of frustration in that regard that we live in a country that has a lot of uh, potential, that has a lot of uh, like freshness, resources, but that doesn't play their cards right. So whenever you, and, and this is assuming a lot of things, I'm not saying that that's what people actually think, that's just what I think about it. Whenever you, try to do something for yourself and then it doesn't work and you see someone doing shit and it's actually really working out for them, I think it becomes frustrating and at some point you might end, end up losing some of that like drive, uh, drive that you had. So I think that's the case in a lot of, um, in a lot of people. Uh, they just keep grinding and grinding and grinding and it's just not working. So whenever they they can be just even. 
said, like they're they're not losing, they're just living, existing, surviving. They're down aiming for anything else. Because life has taught them that they can't go any farther than that. Their helplessness. Yep. Um going back to the, the, the like the stereotypes, the way we see Americans, I think that the most common one it's it's entitlement. I think that's or that's the one that comes to mind to me at least first. Like people that come here, they get here and because they have like the money, they they could just um, ask you around and just uh, boss you around for whatever they need. And you have to adapt. That's the first one that comes to my mind. Entitlement. Like you own something. You yeah. Can like ask like, somebody. Like, yeah. Without working. We <laughs> owe you something just for you being here and having the money to pay for everything. You mentioned system the Mexican system, right? So what I've experienced coming here and also what I've heard from friends is, so before I say that, Mexico is very diverse. Oh super, God. it's super big, diverse. Lots of cultures within it. Yeah. Right? So like living in Merida, three months, living in Tulum more than a year, living in Playa, three months, going to Mexico City several times, Bacalar, like, it's crazy difference, like different planets almost. So the Mexican system as it exists right now, what do you, what do you like, what problems do you see with it? For example, my friends, I know them, they've gotten stopped by the police or by the National Guard and they said, show me this and they didn't have it. And they're like, oh, 4,000 rupees. This is like the standard fee uh, or fine. And uh, they didn't have it. So they, you know, searched the, the purse or the, the wallet and the cops stole it, stole whatever it was, was there. And then the guy got the wallet back and there's nothing in the wallet, right? So this type of corruption is obviously it's in every system. Like it's not like some Mexican development. Like it's every system is corrupt. But is there something special or specific about the Mexican system? Because if we look at, look at what happened during the pandemic, we were all here. We were not in America. We're not in Canada. We weren't going to Bali or anywhere. Like We were here because Mexico was the one country that welcomed us with open hearts and open arms. And whatever the reason is, it could be money or it could be, uh, uh, you know, trying to, trying to, uh, be, become more more powerful as a nation or whatever it is. The fact is that Mexico is the only country, and I think the Dominican Republic is the other one, that was open without any constraints throughout the pandemic. So is there something about maybe the political situation or the government, something about the history or the culture that allowed this to happen? I have a, like a really, really strong opinion about it. And, and it's almost like crazy that you actually went all that deep. So I don't actually have to like go well, all, like all those layers as you have already. And it's my belief that this all originates in, in the colony. To be free from the colony system that we had established from the from Spain, there had to be corruption. There had to be lying within the system. There had to be like plotting. There had to be like these forces playing against the the, the king at that point. Or virrey as, as he was called over here because he wasn't the actual king. It was uh, a uh, virrey that was uh, ruling the whole thing. So they had to be plotting and there had to be corruption for they to take him down. And I think that just, if you start a political system with corruption, you will never get rid of it. Oh, the basis. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's at its core. It was always there. It's not a new thing. It's not, 
And I think it, 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 it comes with the same thing about being such a rich land and in such a rich country, but so poorly managed that the salaries are not good enough for people not to think about stealing. And people will usually go for a political uh, post because they need the money, not because they, they're passionate about making things better for people. It's a job. It's a job. They want the money. They want the power. It's not about people. It's not about calling for making things better. It's about the salary. It's about the, the contracts that you'll get. It's about the bribes. It's not about making a difference. You mentioned Spain. And I've talked to multiple people from here in Tulum and other places, and there is an animosity I can feel towards Spain. Some people who have their ancestors are Spanish and they're here living as Mexicans, they don't really say those types of things, right? What is, what, tell, tell me a little bit about Mexican history. Because I'll tell you one, one thing that Martha and I talk about all the time. You know, we'll, we'll be watching like some, uh, some Native American, uh, American Indian documentary, right? And I'll look at Martha and be like, you know what? These are Mexicans. Holy shit, dude. Like these, like the, 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 pe the shamans and the ones who brought us like Native American culture. These are Mexicans, man. I never figured this out until like last year, right? I was like, this is very interesting. So tell us about like the history of, 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 of this because uh, a lot of people have no idea, even people who grew up in America, right? And, and what happened to the Native Americans by, you know, like a Christopher Columbus, like what, what do you believe and what is the truth here? Well, as you were mentioning it, Mexico's history, Mexico is it's a huge country. Um, extension wise, geographically, it is huge. So there was a lot of things going on. You get the Mesoamerican cultures, like the Mayans, and you get the Apaches and all these um, like warrior tribes in the north. It's so different from each other. It's, it's just different civilizations. So I think that I, I feel whenever I come all the way like Southeast as we are right now, I don't feel like I belong here. Like I don't feel like I feel in my hometown. It definitely feels culturally different. And I know that people, well, not, some people, not, not everyone, but a lot of people just see me as, uh, just as a foreigner as they see you, for example. Yes. Before you start speaking? Yeah. Even before I start speaking. Because of your appearance? Yeah. Yeah, I've got, like, called out at, like, the land of the ATM, stuff like that. Like, there was some lady that was just making a problem out of nothing. And she was like, yeah, you come over here and take our jobs and... Like, maybe she thought I was Argentinian or something because there's just a lot of them over here. But yeah, there's definitely this uh, resistance, and you feel it, and it's totally understandable because um, the Rivera it's it's got a really uh, problematic history, and it's got a history of. Um, mass killings and, and just uh, against the, the original uh, inhabitants. So, yeah, they're, they're, they're still mad. They're still, like, outspoken about it. They're, yeah. And it's understandable. It's totally understandable. So I think that a lot of people, just like we were talking about food and coffee, they don't go as far as in back in history or the details 
and they just at some point it's it I guess it's it's normal it's you're just living whatever you you've been told and then you go from it and you don't get it like into the back history of everything but there's definitely a lot of uh, ignorance when it comes to what the original inhabitants were or where Mexico extended all the way to or it used to be all the way to basically Oregon down from there, so like California, um, Arizona, Texas used to be Mexico as well. So it was may maybe like forty percent of the what the states are right now. So I think there's a big misconception about like the original people that that was there, like the the Native Americans, the and there's definitely a lot of racism and and like problems. And the Western world just make taking them apart because they they're not part of the system that that we're just living in and looked on. So I just digressed. No, no, that's 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 what we want. The from so when we went to Chicxulú, which is near Merida, near in Progreso, we went to this uh, museum where the it was a dinosaur museum, meteorite museum, Meteorita. And, uh, you know, there's all these dinosaurs around with like uh, sculptures of dinosaurs everywhere in this Chicxulub because that was the first impact of, uh, you know, in, in Yucatan. And this impact killed the dinosaurs. And so this ancestry or this history of beautiful scientific work and, you know, like the Mayans, you know, giving a shit about astronomy and like figuring all this out. There's, I, I saw this Graham Hancock documentary and he went to a place near Puebla called Chilahu, Chilaulas. Ch 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 I I know what you're talking about. Yeah, where you're talking about it's um, Chula Chula Chulahuas Chulahas something. It's right by Puebla, like s southeast. And uh, he said, like, look, this is ancient civilizations, more than ten thousand years old. Cholula, that's it. Cholula so many uh you know more than ten thousand years old and look how these they build this beautiful geometric structure and like how the hell did they bring this when they didn't even know any, anything and they were like hunter gatherers but no they built it because civilization existed at that time now if we look at that culture of mexico right and 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 maybe no there was no mexico then but the mexican spirit was there Right, that Mayan spirit, the Aztec spirit, the Incan spirit, like that's there. Has there is it? Where is that spirit today? Right, because when I go to Yucatan and I visit these places, I feel a little bit of of that, like you know, entrepreneurship and and creativity, and I feel that I know in Merida the art was unbelievable you know, the museums we went to the the festivals we went to was awesome but mexico as a whole when it comes to education and science and technology and entrepreneurship i don't see it at all and man mexico can become a first world country one day like legit we have everything here right the, we have the land we have like the the, the money right we have the people the diversity the, where it's located, like the water, right? The hunger for it. The hunger. Where do you see that? Maybe I haven't, I just haven't seen it. Does it exist in the school system? I'm going to say something really controversial. We're too close to the States. <laughs> We're too close to become our, our own real thing. We wouldn't be allowed to. And people that are like brilliant are brought up over there. They're called in to NASA, to like the big companies. 
the system over here doesn't actually the reward system is not in place uh, for those kind of things. It is if you are an investor, an entrepreneur, you get recognized for that. Recognized for that. Not if you're a scientist. It's it's super odd. It's super weird. But I know people that are living on scholarships and they're doing crazy research and doing doing like actual scientific work and they're living on 12,000 pesos a month. There's some money in it. Unless you're in private, uh, in the private uh, sector. So the respect is not there. The status is not there. I mean, they'll they'll get recognized for choosing that because, like we all know, it's it's a struggle. It's not a, a set life. So you have to do it because you love it. Otherwise, you wouldn't be doing it because there's no money in it. And the ones that do great in school, like you said, they get called, or if they discover something, or if they make a company, or they do some kind of art they get called to America and then they just flourish there because America will give them that opportunity. Exactly. There's investors that actually care about those things. And this is not just Mexico. This exists in a lot of places. I always wondered, you know, I, was, I, I always ask my friends, like, is there a certain trick to why the U.S., is so prosperous. Speculation. <laughs> they mastered speculation and credit. For me, for me, that's a major illusion that has worked. Fake it till you make it. Give a perception of what you are and make people believe that, and then you will get the reciprocation from people. They got the store mark, uh, uh, the stake, stock, stock market, got credit. It's just speculation all the way. What about the chance that the U.S. takes in immigrants? Because Russia doesn't do that. What if it's something like that? Like, you know what? Let's take the best of everyone. We'll figure it out. But I think it's a big part of it as well. Like, I think that my first idea was more towards the, the general idea. But then you have to back up what people are thinking that you are. That's where all the labor, all, all the human capital comes in. That's where you recruit the best of the best out of, like, smaller countries. But I... I know that they definitely feed on a lot of like small countries um, geniuses and and like bright people and it's also a, an opportunity for them because otherwise they'll be living on a twelve thousand pesos a month scholarship <laughs> forget about it no it's not worth it the the financial gain has to at least be a little there just a little bit. It doesn't to, have to be like have millions to worry of dollars. Here. About just basic stuff. Wow. It's it's so mind boggling because when I grew up, I was brainwashed, you know, as a scientist, into thinking that you should never run after money. You should not even care for money. So I would be scared to ask for a raise to my PhD boss because Nobody ever asked for a raise. You don't think about money. If you think about money, you're a fraud. You're not a real scientist. So my mom would always like prepare me and she'd be like, you're going to go and you're going to ask for a raise. You're going to ask because you've done too much hard work to get this shit salary. And then I would ask for a raise and then I would get it and so, and so on and so forth. So I did take that risk. The Let's go into uh, family units. 
every family structure is different in different different uh, countries. I remember, uh, I don't know if you know who Elliot Hulse is, but he's a very famous YouTuber, uh, lives in Florida, and he is sort of the father figure to a lot of kids who sort of grew up not having like a father that they can rely on. And so I visited Elliot, uh, just for, went for a lunch last year, um, and, you know, just because he's my friend and I've known him for 10 years and I wanted to talk to him. And uh, so we had this amazing lunch and he gave me so much insight. And one of the things he said is that the American family unit is being destroyed. And whoever is behind this destruction, they are going after the father figure. And it's not just the father, you know, my dad. It's beyond that. It's the godfather also right like the, the 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 god level of father so it's the family unit father but they're also destroying god which is also a father right or like jesus or and so it, this was profound to me because he said if you were to mess up a society if you wanted to corrupt a society if you wanted to destroy a society you simply destroy the family Right? So you inject porn in there. You inject social media in there. You inject easy dopamine hits in there. You inject drugs in there. Right? And what easily will happen is, oh, wait, the father figure is no longer respected. He's no longer relevant. So do you, have you thought about this? And, and do you believe that this is happening to the family unit? And what is the family unit in Mexico? What is, the, what is the role of the father versus the mother? Because in America, a lot of families are becoming sort of egalitarian. Like the mother, the mother earns a salary and is the breadwinner, whereas the father might take care of the kids and, and, uh, and, and cook or take care of the house. Or they both work and the, maybe the kids struggle and, and don't get like that nice environment or like the, the love of the mom as much as they want or the time spent with mom. What's the family unit in Mexico? And do you, have you seen a deterioration of it in, in the culture and society? Well, there's a lot of topics within uh, those lines. First of all, I think it's changing altogether everywhere. And there's some really good things to it changing. Because now it's not, okay, we have to endure marriage. Because we got uh, married when we were like 16 years old. And I have to s s stick to my husband to the end of time, even though he hates me. And But it used to be like that. It used to. So whenever someone talks about attacks on, on the family, on the like, it makes me wonder how much of that was not even like a loving family. It's just the structure. Yeah, it was, it was there. It lasted forever. Yes, it did. But was she actually healthy? Was so for me, as long as you have a loving home with whomever is loving you and you have guidance and you have uh, love and you have caring and you have your uh, basic needs cover, it doesn't matter if it's uh, that figure, two that figures, uh, two mom figures. For me, it's more important that love and caring that whomever is providing it. Um, I have seen a change. There's a lot of people um, getting uh, divorced, but I think that's not a bad thing. Because women are speaking up and they're not just just being an observant on their lives anymore as they used to. So I think that they're now speaking their minds up and, and if they're not happy in a relationship, marriage, 
they can just uh, walk away from uh, trauma, walk away from uh, abuse, and it didn't it didn't used to be the case. So I think there's cons to it. People are speaking about problems because people are just bringing those discussions to the table. And yeah, being a kid of uh, out of divorced parents as I am, I know it's hard, but I rather it being that way than just hearing them fight all the time. I'd rather people splitting up and having a healthy relationship with each other than not standing each other in the same house. So I do think that there is like a power dynamic uh, shift. I do think that there is that we're restructuring a lot of things uh, within society, that we're questioning a lot of things as as we've been thought. Like we've been, because I'm, I'm just getting a bit um like um, conspiracy theorist right now, but I think that like monogamous relationships, marriage was established to make it work as a society. I get it. I get that, like the, the family core. And I don't think that humans necessarily work like that. I think that that was an established system and that people are not as squared as that. We're way more complex. And I see how it works like for purposes of yeah having kids uh, having a house it's it's a replicable system within the system that becomes manageable accountable for that ties people to a certain area so they can just you know manage the the economics of the town and and it becomes reliable if you want to say it like that it's like if you have, I don't know, like a an, an a strategy game and you're playing and, and you know that, okay, well, this town behaves uh, like this and I'll, I know how they roll. I think that we just thought that way. We just thought to just stick in and just um, hurt and just mind our business. And, and I think that we're just slowly getting out of those cages, of those roles, of those uh, systems, of those practices. So I think that this um, loss of power of the paternal figure is just a symptom of a society that is tired of being fed lies, of being fed up power roles, being fed things that are not necessarily a universal truth, but, uh, but just something to just keep the, the, the wheel rolling. So I think that we're trying to reaccommodate and, and to shift things that are Everything is questionable, basically. What I'm trying to say is that I think that the system has pressured us so much that, at least myself, I, I think that everything is questionable at this point and that there's always something behind what seems to be like a, a universal truth. There's, there's always something beyond that. And I don't want to just do what they tell me. Like just, just I just sounded like Rage Against the Machine. <laughs> but yeah, I think there's there's this rediscovery of um, what humans can be or can feel or can do, and that implies questioning everything. 
I hope that are makes. there are there beliefs that you used to have that have changed lately? Lots of them. Lots of them. Uh, for example, whenever I started to go to therapy, uh, being able to just call on my own feelings, which it was something that I never learned from, from being a kid. In my family, it was, I am, I'm mad. Like, what? Why? Uh, he took my toy, but okay, you might, because you wanted to play with it or because you don't want him to have it or like, why are you mad? And I think being able to identify those things and, and why do you feel the way you feel and just validate that makes a huge difference. Makes a huge difference when it, when it comes to knowing yourself and, and knowing what you need and what you should be doing to get that, that you need because no one is, no one else is going to do it. So you have to procure it for yourself. And there's a lot of things definitely that have changed and I'm always open to new things. That's, that's one of the things that, that I love about the way I am. Yeah, I can, I, I can be like really strong opinionated about stuff, but if there's an opinion that makes more sense when it's uh, put in front of me, I'll take it because I'm not trying to defend an opinion, but what works for me. And if someone comes up with something that makes more sense and that works and that it's well thought of, I'll, I'll totally adapt it and, and, and go with it. I'm not square like that. I, I don't need to be tied to a belief system to feel connected to, or to feel myself. I think that a principle that I go by a lot is, is that I'm always adapting, changing, and I don't feel tight necessarily to what I said yesterday, but it's something like something comes up and it makes more sense. I'll, I'll just go with it. One thing you mentioned about your childhood and you, you know, we're, we're bringing this up and then we talked about culture as well. I remember way back in the day, I did a workshop. This is like maybe five, six years ago. And there was a guy in there from Bolivia. And we were talking about vulnerability. And he said that when I grew up in Bolivia, and he mentioned this about general Latin culture, you know, macho culture. And he said that when I was growing up, we were trained to not only hide our feelings, but don't feel them. Like, don't feel them. You feel something? Nah, man. Let it go. That's girl stuff. So... When a person grows up like that, what, how does society become if a, if a man grow, if ever, all men grew up like that, how would society become? And where is the balance? What, what would you do if it, if it was up to you? Where, which would make a healthy family, a healthy man? Like, is it okay for a man to cry? Is it okay for a man to uh, pick up a flower? You know, is it okay for a man to hug a tree? To appreciate poetry? To do fashion and do knitting? To play with dolls? Like, where do we draw the line? Or there's no line. And the fact that you're actually stating those things tells us that there's a really clear line towards what a, a guy should or shouldn't do. So all of those things that you said that could be controversial could be controversial for a reason. And I think at the end it's just about communication and education. But our parents didn't get it. We didn't get it. We're starting to get it like from even social media at this point. Um, there's a lot of good channels if like if you're if you're receptive to listen or, or to read there's a lot of good channels even in 
in platforms like social media. So I think that it's always about communication and, and even with yourself, like being open to yourself and being true to yourself. And at the end, I think there's hard times that um, call for, you know, discipline and, and, and a structure and a routine and hardness and, and that work for our parents. Well, maybe not for mine, but for my parents' parents. And that's fine. I think the world is different right now. And I think if you're going to keep on educating people the same way for they to be successful in a world that doesn't exist anymore, it's going to be really frustrating for new generations because they're going to be out in the real and whatever they thought they had to do, it's not going to be what the real world is like anymore. So I think we're becoming, yeah, maybe it's it's more complex. Maybe it's more problematic. I don't think it is. I, I think it actually solves a lot of problems that we just didn't used to talk about at all. Because people think that something is problematic because you have to discuss it, but we should be discussing everything and settle it and, and make agreements or make, make comp uh, compromises between each other because that, that's relationships. And I think that you have to allow yourself to feel whatever you feel and then learn from it. Learn from it and know yourself, know what situations trigger what um, feelings or actions or responses. I think we, we should all be able to know ourselves and control and, and move within our emotions and, and thoughts. I think we just uh, sometimes give it this, uh, as if it was like a, a separate thing, a uh, separate thing from us. But yeah, my feelings, yeah, my thoughts, as if we didn't have any control over them. And I think it, it'll build a, a stronger society if everyone was in control. Of, not in control as in just shut it, uh, shut them down, but as to be able to feel and recognize and not just react, but act from a previous knowledge of what just happened. I think that will make a healthier um, society. If all of us were more empathic towards each other and towards our ourselves, I think that, that will make a change. But then again, how do you make that? You can turn off your phone at 7 p.m. every day. <laughs> like, like we do. Yeah, man, routine. And, and we talked about routine at the very beginning. Um, you know, like people have a routine of coffee, for example, right? So the routine, and we, Martha and I are talking about this today, literally today after the gym. And we were saying that routine is so good. Like I used to think the opposite back in the day. I had a very chaotic schedule. I didn't know what the hell I was going to do. Right? You get it, right? And so we were like, hey, we wake up. And, and, and dude, like, uh, I, I think I was telling you when we were having dinner the other day, I wake up so early now. It's incredible how early, and it's like my body just wakes up. Like last night, we were in bed at seven, dude. Like seven o'clock. It, it, I mean, we went, by the time we went, it was like seven, we were like preparing to go to bed. And then around uh, eight, we were like, you know, almost asleep. You know, we read, read like really hard shit at night. So it's like easier to go to sleep. Yeah, bro. I'm reading Gulag right now. Gulag Archipelago, the book about the uh, prison camps that Stalin did uh, back in the Soviet Union. And the guy who wrote it was a prisoner. And this book was banned for so long. And he somehow smuggled it to the West. And so this uh, Solzhenitsyn is the guy, the author. And so I, I'm, I'm, I'm like, I think not even half. This book is... It's uh, three volumes. No, it's seven volumes, but it's three books. 
And the first book is two volumes together. And it's like uh, 700 pages. And I'm like barely on page 250. And I've been reading this thing, I don't know, six months. Like it's so dense. And it's like little, little writing. So I'm like, dude, 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 like, dude, if I can read four pages in a day, I'm happy. Right? But doing that at night, it's so easy to go to sleep because I'm like, shit, like it's, it's like my, I'm, I'm done. I'm, I'm exhausted. And so having that routine, like waking up at this time, sleeping at this time, doing this after you wake up, doing this before you go to sleep. And Kaffir and I talk about this a lot, routines. And this type of system that I have now, right? Systems we talked about. Dude, it's so much freedom. Like a lot of, I used to believe that routines are like prison. Like, oh, I have to follow this stupid thing. But man, it really opens everything up. And I, now I believe the opposite, like it's completely change of belief. Now I love routine. Like, dude, even my parents are coming in a couple of months to visit here for uh, four, three or four days. I was like, fuck, our routine's going to get messed up. Holy shit, right? Because we're going to give them the, the, our, our bed in the bedroom and we're going to have a, a blow up mattress that we got. And uh, so, you know, that's going to be different, right? Like waking up, like my dad snores. So are we going to hear him in the, I, I don't know what's going to happen. So like, it's so weird. Like I love my parents. I, I love my family and everyone and they're coming here. And what I can think of is like, oh shit, my routine is going to be messed up, man. Damn it. We're going to have to like get a taxi to go to the beach. And we just take a bike now, right? We're taking a bike every Sunday to the beach. And um, so, yeah, man, this, this, this routine thing is a, is a game that I really want to master and win. It's a tool. It's a tool for whatever purpose you wanted to set it to. And of course it works. Especially for productivity and focus. Like I could have never started this podcast. Man, I, I need to get into that. I know, and I know Catherine is, is big on journaling as well. And yeah. Now she's really into the nighttime routine. Her, day, her morning routine is fixed. It's perfect. But her nighttime routine needs work because she's having a hard time sleeping. She's staying up really late, you know, grabbing like the late night snacks from the fridge. <laughs> no, dude, it's so it's so tempting, man. It's so tempting unless you unless you like wire, you just wire your brain, and then it's like that's all it knows. But I actually like just um going back and forth to, to the Bahamas uh, theme. I'll need to get a routine for there because uh, I can be. The work won't be as permissive as it is over here. Um, so I. Yes, and and I'm going to work with a hospitality big group, so it's going to be more of a corporate job. So I'll, I'll need to tie some knots. Shen, that's so not uh, you. Most likely, yeah, I am most most likely. So not you. Yeah, I know. Yeah, that's it. As I was saying, I, I adapt. Yeah, I adapt, and I, I mean it's it's a. Of course, it's a, an experience that I look, look forward to because I know that there's a lot of that I have to learn from being this like organized and, and just give it a bit more of a serious uh, tint. And I'm looking forward to it, to learning that part about like the administration part of, uh, you know, the, the Excel charts and because I know I, I'll be doing a bit of that and it's exciting, but I know that I will have to pace myself and get a routine. Otherwise, it won't work because it's a small space. It's a small island. It's three hundred thousand people. Right, Nassau. Yes, Nassau. Uh, it's three hundred thousand people. It's like Playa. It's like if you were living in Playa for a whole year. Not, co not. Co Is it a one-year contract? Yes. Okay. That's gonna be fun. Yeah. Going back to another serious topic. Uh, it's about that you, you mentioned adapting. How has Mexican culture adapted to the LGBT thing, right? So, for example, in the U.S., um, I mean, societies. I mean, some people believe like Matt, Matt Walsh recently had this uh, movie. What is a woman? It was a very nice documentary. He basically goes to all these different. He goes to African tribe. It's like you know, ask what a woman is ask different age groups. He goes in the U.S., you know, ask like uh, f feminists. He asked the gender studies uh, professors. Like it was it's like an amazing movie. What is a woman? And uh, nobody can answer this question. 
right? Because like, we don't know. And so because U.S. is so close to Mexico and a lot of culture, you know, gets mingled, right? Like, like the, like, dude, in Toronto, a lot of the people I met, a lot of my friends were from salsa dancing, bachata dancing, right? Like the, the, the Latin stuff, right? And so is there, like, when you see an intermingling of cultures between U.S. and, uh, US and Mexico, has that also come over here? Like now, is it okay to be gay in Mexican society? Is it like, I know in Merida, I saw like guys holding hands, which is like rare. Mexico City, I saw it way more often, right? Um, especially in the areas like a Condesa or, you know? So what's the, what's the vibe like in Mexico for this? Well, I'll say that it's like in most uh, for Latin American countries, there's a lot of machismo going on and it will be there for a while. It's changing uh, slowly rather than um, fast paced. And I do think there's a lot of progress. Um, equalitarian marriage is legal in, within the country, almost every state, but a few exceptions. And so I think at the end, it's, it's about human rights. Like, if you put it like that, is for me personally, if um, someone can feel good about themselves, why shouldn't they? We're all entitled to some um, kind of happiness. And, and um, so I, I love it when I see like young people, for example, because you can see the difference with them and uh, holding hands like young couples, uh, same gender. So it's, it's lovely to see how that's changing like little by little. And at the end, it's just about people being what they are and expressing it loudly and, and openly. For me, that's, there's nothing to talk about over there. It's just, it's so simple. People should be allowed to be themselves. But it's changing. Like, it's changing slowly. And there's a lot of, um, like, going into the the video making part of my, uh, of my life, there's a few documentaries that I've worked in and collaborated with. And one of them was actually about trans people. Really? Yes, trans women. You shot, shot it, shot it, edited it, and it's it's a short uh, documentary that was um, actually part of a contest. Uh, really? Yeah. Although, is it on YouTube? We can watch it. I don't know if it's on YouTube, but I'll I'll get you the link for sure. Yeah. What's it called? It's called, um, man, I just lost it. Let me know. We'll put it in the notes. Yeah, people can watch it. It'd be cool. It's in Spanish though. Hey? It's in Spanish, but it's actually subtitled. Yes. Wow, man. If you if you made something, I definitely want to watch it. Yeah, and and well, it was really rushed because he was about making it in a, within a hundred hour uh, time frame. Oh, because so it was yeah, it was shot, uh, edited, and and all of that within a hundred hours. So it was two thousand and nineteen, and I have to say that I was so oblivious to what um, their life is usually like. It's horrible, man. It's horrible. In most stories, was it? It was. A, it was not. Like, it was like real. Yeah, trans. yeah it yeah. wasn't like. Yeah, it was. No, no, it was a documentary. Um, we followed and basically lived by the side of um, of a trans woman. She's uh, an activist. She's a sex worker, and the usual like, their um, lifespan. It's the, the average lifespan for trans women in Mexico. It's 35 years old. Jesus. Yep. Yep. It's horrible. And I'm sorry, I'm getting emotional. A month after we end up um, the documentary, one of the girls that we interviewed was killed. So, 
So it's just like a broad statement about how difficult it is to express your um, sexuality or not even sexuality, just uh, your gender uh, preference in Mexico. Trans women are um, looked down on or um, pursued or killed really often. Really, really often. So it's it's changing, but it's not fast-paced enough, I'll say. There's a lot of work that needs to be done yet. So there, this was a, a man who transitioned into a woman, and you interviewed her during the documentary, and a month later she died from a homicide. Someone killed her. There was actually two of them, but one wasn't interviewed. One wasn't on frame. But there was two girls. Yeah. There was two, two women. I had no idea. A 35-year-old life expectancy for, expectancy. Yeah. for a trans woman. What about the other way around? Did you interview uh, men? No. It's less common. Oh. It's less common. And I only have like a couple of friends, maybe, that have them uh, transitioned. But... It's less common. You see it less often. So they get a lot of uh, hate from family? Not as much. It's somehow, the the other way around, it's harsher. Well, I don't know if, if harsher. Like, I'm not in their shoes, but for what I've seen, it's um, easier to cope with a, with a daughter that wants to be your son instead of a son that wants to be a daughter. Family is usually the hardest. They usually kick him out. and Because they need to show their face to society. Exactly. They really care. Is this a thing in Mexican culture like status? It is. It is. It's different within the, the, the circle that you move at. But there's definitely some circles that are just all about status. It's a community culture, not an individualistic culture. Not at all. Right? Yeah, it's a community. Like America is a very individualistic. Japan is very community. Mexico is more like community. Not me, 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 I, I, I. It's we. How I relate to my father or my daughter or my friends. It's a relational thing. So that may affect it more, wouldn't it? Because in an individualistic society, like, like fuck oh, off. Yeah. You the you and I'll do me and but that's not how it works. No, it, it's not. It's 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 interesting because like if you look at the history of trans, the very original trans are Indian. They're known as hijras, hijras, and what basically what used to happen is, or this still happens, they will come to a wedding, and they'll dance. They're full of love. They'll like give a prayers to the baby. Right, and then like I, I one of my uh, my uh, my uh, grandfather's brother, uh, Kabir uncle, we call him uh, Kabir Chacha. Dude, he's so funny. Like uh, whenever the hijras came to our weddings, and you know they would like act like you know they would they they're they're men, but they're acting like women because they've like it's it's like uh, they've transitioned. I don't think they've done like surgery or anything, but they've transitioned like uh, with how they dress and obviously their mind. Uh, or, or how it probably always was. And he would like dance with them. And, you know, it was always this tradition, like Kabir Chaj is going to go dance with them. And so the, the in Indian society, they're given respect. Like they're, they're like, these are the, the women who are going to bless our child, right? They're going to bless the couple who just got married. Because we believe, or like Indian culture believes, that they carry a lot of spirit. Like God has given them an extra level of blessings, right? And uh, Manuel, your your um, emotions towards her, the the lady who you interviewed and she uh, got killed. That is it because you knew her, or is it because you feel that there is injustice going on? That's it. I mean, obviously, the the fact of getting to know her was part of it. But it, it's not just her. That just happens 
almost every day. The numbers for uh, trans uh, women get, getting killed is are they're huge. Is it also suicide? There's a lot of suicide. There's a lot of um, killings and like hate crimes. Uh, and it's fun that you uh, brought up that um, the thing about India because um, in uh, some of the Wahagan, uh like, how do you portray that? I don't want to say tribes, but the ethnic groups of um, some of the Oaxaca ethnic, ethnic groups, uh, they actually have a third uh, third gender. Yes. And this is ancient. So there is uh, an acceptance culture as well. And they're usually the ones that will uh, stay at home and take care of their parents when they grow old. So... There is love, there is acceptance towards them, there is a lot of empathy, they're just not looked down on on their society. And, and it, we're talking it an ancient culture where there's machismo within that culture as well, yes. But even there, there's a space for it, for that freedom, for that, um, that um, choice. Or maybe it wasn't a choice, yeah. I'm just getting too far into it, but there was definitely this factor of um, getting to know Valeria, and it was really odd because um, she actually, the last day that we were shooting, she um, she reached out and she gave me this um, little like like souvenir like uh, camera, like here here you go, this for she you. She knows that you love this. Like here you go, this is a present for you. Of course, it was personal at that time. First thing they tell you when you're shooting documentary, don't get involved. Why wouldn't you? What would you be doing in the first part if you weren't getting involved? It's, it's like you're a doctor. They're, they're like, don't get involved with the patient, right? But this night, yeah, that's not. That's not how it works. We're humans. We're, we'll, we'll get involved. So, yeah, man. I haven't think about that in a long time. <laughs> Yeah, no, thank you for opening up to that, man. I really appreciate that. And and uh, the last thing I want to ask you, and I, I know you have to flight to catch soon, and you also, um, you know, it's, it's a privilege to have you and, and you giving us this time. This is this, you know, true friendship, man, and, and opening up fully. And, and I know your parties going on and all the, you know, <laughs> a lot of, a lot of people, and the, the fact that you cared enough to, to share your story and, and uh, one thing I want to ask you at the end is, um, where do you see hope in society? Where do you, where, where do you, what do you get excited about when you look at the future, your own, in your own life, where maybe you, where you want to go mentally or like in terms of physically, like travel or what you want to become maybe in, in like a, um, a, a Maybe it's like a, a strength that you want to master something, you know, like a transformation that you're very excited towards. Tell me some hope that we have uh, in, in our world that, that you can really feel right now. Well, I think that going back to um, adaptability, yeah, a lot of the problems that humanity faces are because we are just too stubborn to try to change. So I think that things are changing. Even if it's a, at a slow rate, I think things are changing. And even though like most people call new generations like flaky or um, weak, or I think they're so malleable. Like they're just learning from everything we've done wrong. And if not changing it, changing it, they're at least informed about it. So they have the power to just change things around. And they're not as stubborn. And I think they're more flexible in a lot of ways. And I think there's a lot of hope in that. There's, they're open to discuss things. They're open to 
to embrace new ideas, to be more empathic, empathetic. I think there's a lot of potential over there. And I think that whenever we see that change in demographics, things are going to start to change. Things are... New people will come into power. Yes. And new ideas and new ways of doing things and maybe like dissolving some of the like old structures that we've tied to that we're tied to so yeah i think there's a lot of hope in that and myself i i, I would love to s get to the point where where i can just um become a tool for people to be more aware of like issues and and make it more relatable for them uh, in the form of images and, and video work because I think that yeah maybe it's given a bit of a kick because it's as you know it's cinema and documentary I'm, I'm I'm a documentalist. For some reason, like it's better to see it in Netflix than to actually hear the person next to you talking to you about something. <laughs> I don't know why. It's for some reason it's given more strength because it's cinematic. So I think that there's a way to make a change over there, like showing people what the real world looks like out of their comfort zone what the real places look like. For example, Tulum. I would love to just do something about the actual native people from here and, and just show the the world a bit of what they uh, their lives is, are like. I think there's a lot of value in, in that and and I think that contribute that can contribute to make us more empathetic and, and more aware and take ed educated decisions about how we think about others. Wow. So you see hope in our youth, the new, the new, the millennials, the Gen Z. generation. Yeah. Gen Z. I do. Beautiful, man. That's so cool. That's so cool. And, and you're in a great position because you're going to be with people. You're going to be with all these cultures. I mean, you already are, but now in, on a different way, right? A different type of tourism and, a, and then meeting different people. Dude, great conversation. Thank you so Lovely. much, man. Bottom of my heart, thank you for opening up, vulnerable and honest. And uh, yeah, anytime you're back in Tulum, we come for round two. Uh, for sure, man. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Appreciate the space and the time and the friendship as well. Friends for life. Thank you, buddy.